welcome to the Industry Reviews and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanjay. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I have beheld Brat Lestia, and it is surprising. Yeah, she's pretty bratty. <laughs> but still, yeah, Brat Lestia is fun Lestia. Oh my, I didn't know you went for the bad girls, Norman. Well, uh, no, I, I got no comeback for that. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's like the It's like the song goes. Good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere else. Ooh. Oh, 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 please. Don't blame me, blame Meatloaf. Alrighty then. So, anywho, in this episode of the Yes Show, we are going to review The Legends of Magic issue number one. Um, this is a comic by IDW, and also it is a Patreon sponsored video by Starstream. Thank you so much, my friend, for sponsoring this video. And Everything that's related to the Legends of Magic series. Yeah, been stacking off that one. So yeah, sorry about that. But anywho, um, in this issue, Sunburst discovers an old legend left behind by Starswell the Bearded. What might that legend be? Well, tune in to find out. Yeah. Hi, my. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my. <laughs> Boys. Uh, anywho. Before we start, let's hit into first impressions. And Silver, what do you think of Sid Book? Well, this one was a bit of a surprise in that I thought it was going to be about Star Swirl the Bearded, whom we would learn later was a jerk. <laughs> but no, this this is more Celestia and Luna's story. And Star Swirl is merely an observer. So we get to learn about their history, and I'm all for that. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I did enjoy the presentation of Celestia, and how she behaved. We'll get into that uh, properly. Mm-hmm. But as a kickstart to The Legends of Magic, I thought this was a wonderful uh, outing. Mm-hmm. True that, true that. And this book is, well, the way that they came up with this comic is to introduce the pillars of magics before they revealed it in the show, which they kind of failed because um, the TV show and the comic books could not do timing. Yes. Well, in fairness, people... Uh, multiple countries releasing multiple episodes at different times. It's not It's not like the show staff and the comic staff failed. It's that the other countries failed to honor a schedule. <laughs> okay, Silver, I, I need to ask, uh, not including the other countries' release, did the o- official American or the official uh, Discovery Channel release uh, coincides with the comic release? I believe so, yes. Really now? Yes. Oh, all righty then. At the very least, the comics came out before the, either the comics came out before and they left things properly nebulous, or like, I believe from Somnambula, uh, the, the comic came out after the episode, and so the, and the comic treats it that way. Hmm, alrighty then. Um, well, uh, like you mentioned before, we can't really blame everything on one person, it's multiple countries. Yep. No, we can blame any and why, but, you know, that's that's just the standard fare. Yeah, true that, true that, true that. So, uh, where was um, it? Did you um, say your piece, Silver? Yep. Mm. I've had my piece. All right. And as for me, I like this comic. This comic was an interesting outlook on the history of the ponies that we wanted to know for so long now. And, yeah, um, if you guys are a lore buff... You should pick this up and take a good read. It's interesting to see what happened and what they could do and stuff. Like, I'm just using vague words here to describe my feelings for said comic because if I were to say anything more, it would be spoilers. So yeah, it was an interesting read. Anywho, if you guys have not read this comic yet, pause here and go read it for yourself. There's a trade paperback for this one. So yay, all in one book. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the comics and... Let's get right into it. Before you do, mm-hmm. I found my other piece. Ooh, what's that? <coughs> oh no, it hurts. Oh, boys. But anywho, um, we start off the comic with Celestia introducing Sunburst to a locked room. A quote-unquote study for Star Swirl the Bearded. And yeah. I don't know. Slash Fix have started this way. Oh god, no. Oh yeah. god, no. <laughs> what, yes. what book have you read, Silver? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, I think I do. You know what? Later, later, after the show, after the show. So, hey. It's titled Fifty Shades of Maine. Oh, no. 
But anywho, Celestia tells Star Sunburst about um, the library or book or study, and it belongs to Starfall the Bearded. And Sunburst asks, why didn't you kind of go through it and clean it up or whatever it is? And Celestia just says that um, at first we thought he'll come back and we didn't really want to disturb his stuff and whatnot. And after I banished my sister to the moon or into the moon, depending on where you read it. And yeah, I didn't really feel quite right. So we just thought about, you know, locking it up and not really going through it. Yeah, leaving that one room for, you know. Twilight will have a fun time reading through all those books, but now nah, we're not going to let her. We're going to give you the privilege of emerging to Star Souls the Builder's book. So yay, have fun. And it, it starts right away by hinting at uh, Star Swirl's ego. One of the great heroes of our time, Star Swirl, was known for facing up magical creatures and forces no other pony would dare. He was also quite handsome and attractive with all the ladies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He certainly wasn't known for his small ego. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think by this point here, um, Hasbro already has a, whatchamacallit, this... Um, image for Star Swirl because if you remember way back when we had the Andy Price version of Star Swirl and yeah he was kind of a goof. Yes but there are similarities all iterations of Star Swirl tend to suffer from tunnel vision. True but I think Andy Price's version of Star Swirl was tunnel vision but he was a lovable goof and the official version was tunnel vision and he has a big ego on his shoulders. Yeah. Well, we can we can talk about the multiple iterations of Star Swirl. I believe there's at least three. And uh, there's the uh, Katie Cook version, the baby Star Swirl. Baby Star Swirl? Yeah, before he, um, I think, what, what? I oh, think he was oh, his. Yeah, thing, yeah, where he got his hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anywho, getting right back on track. <laughs> yes, yeah, sp- speaking of babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Sunburst starts reading the book, and we get to see long, long time ago. In a galaxy far away now. Wait, no, that's something else. But anywho, um, long, long time ago, we get to see Star Swirl teaching the two princesses. And oh, boys, this is an interesting outlook on them. It is. Uh, one interesting note is if you look at the credits page of the individual issue, it won't be, uh, it won't be available in a trade paperback. The frame they have, Celestia has a pure pink mane. Mm-hmm. But when you get to uh, the story proper, the main ha- now has a gradient going from pink to turquoise. Turquoise would yeah. it be turquoise to blue? Something like that. Yeah, let's go for turquoise. Turquoise and green. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And basically, I, I guess it's fun that they're depicting Celestia as so young. I mean, Luna, we had her young design from the very first episode. There's also some humor in this uh, at BabsCon. Andy Price said that for reflections, there there's a scene where Twilight and Fluttershy are looking at a painting of Celestia and commenting, she looks so young. And she looks exactly like she does in the show. <laughs> I, uh, IDW did not want to risk a continuity uh, faux pas, so they insisted that just draw her the way she always looks. Uh, with her main gradients? Well, it was a black and white painting. Oh, okay. But here... Celestia is smaller, more narrow. Her mane is not, it's ethereal flowing. It's still voluminous. I wonder what shampoo she uses, but still. Uh, And the epically pouty look as she torments her sister. (laughs) You know, Silver, for the shampoo, it's hips and shoulders because she's worth it. That's Gloria. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Uh, But still, for aesthetic wise, yes, I do like this Celestia or this iteration of Celestia because yes this is what um, almost a thousand or two thousand years or more right we have to say that right at least a thousand years and change yeah so this is young Celestia before the this is the castle of the two sisters right yeah Canterlot has not yet been built yeah so this is the castle of the two sisters I think so I'm not 100% sure but yeah um, it's way out there and we have to make the princesses look young. Um, Luna has already had the, her young look, so that's established. But Celestia has not. And in one scene, she looks like Ferdelise. Just a little bit. That'd be funny. I look like a young Celestia. That means I'm both attractive and young, right? <laughs> Celestia's just 
off to the side with a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> oh, boys. Oh, but still, uh, we're getting off track. Um, so, yes, uh, we are introduced to Star Swall teaching the princesses about magic. But, yeah, it seems that Celestia has an attitude problem. She's She likes to torment her little sister, which <laughs> we've always known Celestia has a little bit of a trollish sense of humor. Mm-hmm. But apparently it was much, much worse growing up. And Nightmare Moon seems a little bit more believable looking at all this. <laughs> Why does Tristan and Joey saying torment is popping in my head? I'm tormenting you. <laughs> was that for Yugi? I, I don't remember. Uh, well, uh, it, it was both. <laughs> they they like tormenting and then Yugi got some payback. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, but still. But, but Star Swirl, he ain't pulling any punches with these princesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, because while he makes Celestia put down Luna, whom she'd been flinging about in a magic bubble, she then comments to Luna, you're not keeping pace with your sister, so of course she's going to act out of frustration because she's being held back. <laughs> yes, and this is one of those situations where if you ever had a sibling, this kind of situation happens all the time. And I'm even seeing that with my nephews. And for example is that my current um, nephew who is four i think is a quick learner and stuff and he gets a lot of things that i really don't because i'm too old to understand anything of what he's doing and he learns things fast he even goes to tuition at age four just imagine that and his little brother i think um sorry was it five or four anyway um his little brother i think a year younger than him would be three is also going to tuition. So if you have that competitive streak and whatnot, you'll see those kind of situations happen. And yeah, that's kind of almost true to life. Ain't that right? Indeed. Basically, people learn at different paces, but sometimes, especially when you're going for a very specialized role, i.e. ruler of a nation, Mm -hmm. uh, you got to push. Now, it's not necessarily fair to Luna who is the younger sibling, to ask her to keep pace with her older sister. But as we'll learn, Star Swirl's not great with ponies. <laughs> yes, that is also true. But I do have to comment one thing. Where did this two came from? Well, that, that we may never know. Yes, but um, besides that, Luna laments that she's not picking up the pace and whatnot. And... The, the next scene, we get to see her flying off to the gardens trying to learn the bubble spell. And miserably failing. And lighting bushes on fire. Oh no. I, I do have to comment on one thing. I really, really love Brenda Hickey's artwork on this. She has that style where the ponies are very expressive. Oh yes, it's, it's beautiful. And she draws the alicorn princesses in all these unique and uh, energetic poses. Mm-hmm. Usually they're a little stiff. True that. And even in the scene where Luna accidentally burns a shrub, her, the way that Celestia is well, poking fun at Luna is really cool. Look at that pose where she's standing on two hoofs on her left side, which questions why is she not toppling down yet? Because she's showing off her mad balancing skills. And with that little pose, you can see that she's What's him call this? Cocky? Oh, yeah. She's proud and just loves teasing Luna endlessly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and tr- um, trying to prove uh, her point, Luna activates a spell to open a dimension to another world. And unfortunately for us, it ain't EQG. So, yeah. yeah but th- this, you can tell this will only end a disaster. What? EQG? Well, that one, that one. Started off as a disaster and worked its way up. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is to another wall. A dark and scary wall. Oh, no. Darkness has the dimension of Charlie, my friend. Oh, no. And said dimension is calling to her. Luna, come to us. We see great power in you. We will teach you to embrace the darkness in you. <laughs> so, basically, Teen Angst Luna, then. Teen, teen angst Luna, even though she's more adolescent at this point. Oh, yeah. Celeste true. is more of the teen angst right now. But anywho, um, Luna comments on, did you hear that talking? Um, 
Uh, that's scaring me. And Celestia says, no, nah, nobody's talking to you. You must be cray-cray or something. And somehow, the alternate dimension is pulling Luna in. Celestia tries to save her, but fails. And yes, she cries and goes to Starswell asking for help. Oh no. And Starswell, <clears throat> despite his, his attitude, even he can be a bit of a goof when you see him waking up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So anywho, he, uh, he asks what happened. And yeah, um, Celestia breaks down what happened and goes to the garden. And yeah, Starswell is not sympathetic at all. He's just like, see their face on. Like, let's get this over with. I need to get my beauty sleep. Mm-hmm. Well, see, I don't think he's that impatient, but he's, uh, he does take the opportunity to reprimand Celestia for how basically she's being a lousy sister. Mm, true that, true that. And, yeah, let's go through it, because I have a comment on this version of Celestia. Uh, so, Starswell activates the portal magic, and luckily enough that he's able to replicate the same gate. Alrighty then. So, they went through, and said world is very creepy, yo. It's something about the coloring. It looks... All the red leaves just look off. Reddish purple. Mm -hmm. And the grass is just that wrong shade of green. Almost toxic. True that. And then there's a bunch of Super Mario mushrooms. If they eat them, I'm sure they'd grow. No, Silver. No, no. We have to tell the children at home, if you see a wild mushroom with red... Um, with the base color of red and white spots, it's poisonous. Do not eat them. You will not grow big. Well, you might grow big, but you also grow dead. Yeah, six feet under. Uh, just have to PSA out there. So, anywho. <laughs> uh, but anywho. Celestia rushes towards the... What was it again? Uh, she's that way because... Uh, she starts to activate a crying spell, was it? Yeah, he, w he had a tracking spell for Luna. Mm, yes. And Celestia sees it and runs down to go and save Luna. And it seems that Luna was kidnapped by rocks. Mm -hmm. Cosplaying rocks. Yeah, yeah. What would they call in God of War Silver? Well, they go by different terms. Soul eaters or soul devourers, yeah. well, elementals. These are, these are not, these are more golems. Mm. But well, um, Celestia says no to that and destroys them or kind of laser zaps them and their way of defending themselves is to throw a rock at it i it was a big rock <laughs> yes yes but actually there's a there's a topic for discussion right here because they're forcing luna to dress up as nightmare moon even though she herself doesn't know what nightmare moon is yet and here's the thing when i wrote a, a blog piece on this i i criticized to me, this was implying that the forces of darkness gave shape to Nightmare Moon and Luna was just a victim, which undermines the fall from grace story or the cautionary tale of Luna's fall into Nightmare Moon. And Jeremy Wheatley, uh, author of this here uh, issue, he actually posted about that on his Twitter. Oh, really? No. Uh, yes, he clarified... Um, Basically, the, the forces of darkness are seeing Nightmare Moon within Luna. Oh. And uh, so they're trying to give rise to what's already there. My issue with that, pun intended, my issue with this comic, Luna is still young. Her, her resentment of Celestia is still being nurtured. It wasn't until she felt neglected by Equestria itself that Nightmare Moon was given free reign. So to both be able to name Nightmare Moon and dress Luna up as it, I feel like it's it's making it too solidified too early. It'd be something if they knew that Luna was darker, there was a darkness in her, but it was still being given shape. It was still moldable. Hmm. And as we'll see in the annual for the for this series, both Nightmare Moon and Daybreaker are are already established in these in these dark creatures minds did jeremy really responded to your posts or something like that yeah who oh, really now right, yes i shall try to i shall it was a while ago but let me see if i can uh, find the previous tweet oh wow that is awesome on so many levels i'm a fan of the death of the author concept that intention falls away in the gulf between storyteller and story mm -hmm. or and or audience but I also appreciate that he's willing to share 
uh, his insights and talk about, you know, the um, just what the ideas were for this. It's great when they're willing to communicate in such a positive and constructive way. Mm-hmm. True that, true that, because sometimes when, <laughs> in, in even in the comics, like comics are tier two canon, by the way, so whatever one person could say could be overwritten in the blink of an eye when the show says something. So, yeah, too bad. But in this current situation here, we have so many renditions of Nightmare Moon or the birth of Nightmare Moon or whatever it is, because we had the official opening said that um, Nightmare Moon was trapped in the moon while others were saying it was on the moon or something like that. And then we had the comic, uh, four-part comic, starting from issue 5, where, oh, the nightmare is some kind of gooey, sticky smoke thingy, was it? Ooh, sticky, sticky. Uh, An infected rarity, and she became Nightmare Rarity, which was hot. And then, yeah, so the idea or the conversation piece about Princess Luna or Nightmare Moon here is a bit muddy. And here, with this backstory of this alternate universe seeing that there's potential for darkness in her, or in my eyes, it's more or less a future prediction that this pony has great evil in it. We must worship it. We must harness its evilness. But them not knowing that it's not there yet. Did you find the tweet, Silver? I'm still looking. It was a while ago. Mm, Okay, no problem. No problem. So, anywho, I'll just carry on and let's see. Um, Celestia Mega blasts everybody with a um, solar flare and everybody gets knocked out. Celestia saves Luna and yeah, she shakes off all that hit gear and whatnot and they run back to the portal. It seems that the forest doesn't want them to leave and it starts producing this really huge rock golem. Oh no, it is a huge rock golem wanting to squish the girls. And this is where uh, Celestia and Luna stop becoming environmentalists. If anything, it's why they want to burn down the Everfree Forest. <laughs> oh, no. But before that happens, Starshall the Beard comes in and saves the girl by laser blasting the big rock creature and telling the girls to run away, oh, run away, go to the portal. And yeah, Celestia says, let's get out of here. While Luna says, what about Starshall? We need to save him. We need to help him. Oh, no. And she says it in that tone. Don't question it. <laughs> uh, yes. But anywho, um, oh, you found the tweet. I found the tweet. I'll open it up for a bit and see what he says. Uh, so it seems from the comment on Silver Quill's review, I set off a bit debate in the fan community. Let me clear up something. Uh, the implication in the comic is... Not meant to be that Luna needs an outside force to become Nightmare Moon, but that it sees potential in her. The evil forces seeking to draw out that potential for darkness by dressing her up as an evil future self, but is unsuccessful. Luna will eventually be the one that draws this force out of herself as she grows stronger and more jealous, but here she's reduced. Okay, um... Basically, what I mentioned before, it was really interesting. I might link it in the link below or the, what you call this thingy when you click to see more info on the video. Yeah, I might link that up. But yeah, basically, a good chunk of this is just a straight up action rescue scene with, I'd argue that this is Celestia's story. It's Celestia who undergoes the greatest change Mm -hmm. uh, throughout this tale. Also, looking through these pictures again, I realize now in some angles, uh, let's see here, like where the, the the panel where Luna says, you came for me, and Celeste replies, of course I did, you're my sister. Or where uh, Celeste, the rock creatures are throwing rocks at Celestia and she's highly offended. <laughs> Her mane is stylized a lot like Cadence. Well, I don't blame the artist for doing so because, well, um, this is young version of Celestia and her ethereal, is that how you say it? Ethereal. Uh, ethereal. Yeah. 
her ethereal main has not been established yet, so yeah. Oh no, I'm not blaming. I'm just noticing. I actually like the style that it emphasizes Cadence is a young princess herself. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe with a little more time, she too will get that wavy mane going. True that, true that. And yeah. <laughs> Celestia's statement here saying, only I get to pick on my sister. <laughs> it's much more. Sister complex. <laughs> yes, yes. But anywho, uh, we, we where we last left off was, yes, um, Celestia wanted to run while Luna was worried about Star Swole. And Celestia's saying, Star Swole can take care of himself. As they reach the portal, Luna is worried about Star Swole and asking what to do and whatnot. And the Celestia says, you know what, uh, it's my fault and whatnot, but you kind of need to close the portal. Yes, close the portal with Star Swirl in it. Yep. I love the expressions that Star Swirl uh, dives through the closing portal and batters the two hugging <laughs> sisters aside. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that Luna face is much cute. The, the Luna face, I think the Luna face wins, though Celestia's surprise face is a very close second. Yeah, but well, why Why would Celestia close the portal when she knows that Star Trek is over there? <laughs> this raises a lot of questions. Actually, I don't think she said they go through the portal. Mm-hmm. You but it. I don't think Celestia says you have to close it. It seems to be closing on its own. Mm, probably, but still. I don't think Celestia was leaving Star's world to his fate, if that's what you mean. Well, probably. Maybe Brighty Celestia is... Yeah, well, let's see. I've been... Yeah, it's true that Celestia is a bad sister and she learns from this. And I hope that she... Well, yeah, she's going to be a wonderful sister soon enough. And... Well, okay, there's going to be a, a low point. Let's <laughs> just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, true, true. But we go back to the present day where um, Sunburst is reading and yeah, she gives the book to Celestia and the two sisters reminisce on said accounts and uh, they have a great time. And next time we'll read about Rock Hoof and the Mighty Helm. <laughs> Which is my favorite issue. Oh, yes. But I love the... Luna seems to be having a good laugh. Celestia, I think, looks just still just a little nervous. I think... She still carries a bit, some guilt over uh, what happened with Nightmare Moon. The Daybreaker uh, dream, that gave rise to it, or, or gave expression to it. But I don't think she's ever had to fully just accept that that may have been her greatest failure, losing her sister. Now here's the part where I have conflicting memories on stuff, because didn't she acknowledge that she had multiple failures? Uh, from uh, Nightmare Moon to Sunset, multiple failures, but I think that, but I, but I think uh, Nightmare Moon was the biggest. Sunset had her own problems. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just remembering words. Like I, I think she mentioned that Sunset was also one of her, her greatest failures, if I remember right. What was that? Well, I'm thinking of the fall of Sunset Shimmer, where she said, where Sunset said. You're gonna regret this. This was a you just made a mistake, and and uh, Celestia said, "Well, that wouldn't be the first. <laughs> oh wow, yeah. But still, um, with that episode, uh, sorry, with that comic ends, or to be continued to the next issue. So let's head into final thoughts. Silver, what do you think of said comic? Well, I thought this comic was uh just a lot of fun, and a good introduction. It's not really about Star Swirl. It's about Celestia with a little side anecdote about Luna. And I I really enjoy that this mature, graceful, and seemingly benevolent uh, ruler started out as a bratty kid, (laughs) which gives some hope, actually, you know, that we all, we grow, we change, and it's never just the end. True, true. And, well, um, as we go on in future issues, um, not this one, or as Celestia goes further in time, we get to see her um, learn more. And, okay, I, I have to raise up a question here. Um, within the timeline, after after Nightmare Moon banishment to the moon, was Star Swirl still around or not? Not. He was trapped in limbo then. 
Okay, so basically, what I, whatever happened in the reflection arc is null and void. Then, mm, well, the reflection arc was set before Luna's fall. Well, it was kind of in between, really, because I think there was a point where after Celestia banished um, Nightmare Moon to the moon, uh, they know. went dimension hopping and they found a world similar to them with a stunning. Young looking King Sombra. Um, I'm afraid we're getting timelines mixed up. This was when they first met the good King Sombra, Luna was still in Equestria. She was displaying a lot of attitude ang- and anger issues. Uh, Celestia commented, I haven't seen a smile on that face since for so long. However, later in the story, Celestia admits that after Luna's fall, she visited that dimension more and more because, well, there was a, sis- a version of her sister there. Mm-hmm. So the arc, the story of Celestia's folly goes through before Luna's fall and after. But we only see the before stuff. And uh, during all that time, Starshell was there. Yep, and he made a right mess of it. Yep, and at the same time too, with what we know now, technically, the quote-unquote reflections arc could be null and void. Like, this is just one big headache. Well, that's, like you say, that's the life of second-tier canon. Yep. Oh, but still, but still. Um, what else do you need to add, Silva? Um, nope, that, that was it. Um, well, I guess for the issue, it's fun. It's more of an action adventure with a characterization at the beginning and at the end. Stars World jinx it by saying, oh, yeah, we totally avoided a problem, and I'm sure the sisters will have no trouble going forward. <laughs> wink, wink. Oh, wow, yeah. It's like saying, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> or, what could go wrong? <laughs> Do not tempt fate. Fate will not be tempted. <laughs> or, wearing a red shirt, yeah. Oh, boys. Uh, re- wearing a red shirt while th- three days from retirement and you want to <laughs> tell the girl you love that you m- want to marry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, all the tropes are in one. Sh- oh, boys. But anywho, yeah, um, as for me, this comic was a fun read. Um, it's not what I expected at first, thinking that we start off the adventure with Starswell, but with a backstory to Celestia, it was pretty cool. And the artwork for this really makes the character stand out more. Um, the funny scenes were highlighted by the amazing art by, by Brenda Hickey, and the expressions for them are really good and awesome uh, there's i'm having a hard time not liking this comic issue because the artwork here is spectacular yeah i i don't see what the, what's there to not like mm-hmm. okay i i admit people if there's one thing i've learned from my interactions with folks online people who want to find the negative will mm-hmm, mm-hmm. true true and there, i'm sure there's things you can critique in this but by and large i found it an enjoyable and fun ride true that true that and i dare say that um brenda hickey is my number she's tied to number one or number two spot for my favorite artists in terms of my little pony official work and the price is still up there so yeah he's still a strong number one but brenda hickey is uh, nipping at that number one spot too so yay uh, but other than that um great story Nice backstory to the princesses and also Star's World. And yeah, the way that they introduce the legends by reading a book, that was fun. That was fun. If I do remember right, um, the first three legend story were before the Campfire episode. Am I right? Uh, th- these issues came out well before <coughs> uh, Campfire Tales. Yeah, so that's why I, I remember... I'm- uh, the timing was a bit off because, huh, Rockhoof, he's already joined and he's blah, blah, blah and stuff. Yeah, it took a little while. Mm. But anywho, um, Silver, what are we going to do for the next review? Well, I believe for the next review, we're going to return to this show because season eight is well underway and we need to do some reviewing. Yes, yes. And next week we'll be doing season eight, episode four. Fake it till you make it. It's going to be so woke. Oh, God. Uh, This episode, 
this episode. I remember watching this episode and loving it. <laughs> uh, but still, this is for next week's review and whatnot. So stay tuned to catch that one. And yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things to say about this one. So anywho, if you guys would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com. With every support, you'll get a week's early access to the review and discussion podcast and deleted content. And a huge thank you from me. Talking about the thank yous, I'd like to thank Lurker Cat, Starstream, myself, like Amy, Charles, Lucky Knight, and also Tristan. Thank you so much, guys, for the awesome support. And Silver, where can the good people find you? Well, you can find me on the YouTubes. Just look for Silver Quill or After the Fact. Uh, keep your eyes open for my What About Discord review. Uh, I will be. I post on Equestria Daily every Wednesday with a comic review. Uh, at the time we're recording this, the the return of Tempest Shadow has been pushed back a week, and so I shall conclude my retrospective on uh, Friend, Friends Forever. And I am also on Zdeviant Art, where you can see graphics, uh, vectors, and title cards. And the Pinkie Pie Says Goodnight series. Just look for MLP hyphen silver hyphen quill. Awesome, awesome. And be sure to check him out, guys, because Silver Quill is an awesome dude. And trust me, this guy will make you laugh. Wee! <laughs> uh, uh, no 100% effective if I have a so true, but still, still entertaining. So, anyway. It's I, I know Norman's Achilles heel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it last week that you did? That got me laughing <laughs> madly because it was a combination of two things. Oh, wow. Uh, I, t- I tend to do two things together. Yeah, I can't remember if it had something to do with Ladybug, but eh, well. So, anywho. Um... Oh, oh, God, miraculous Ladybug. <laughs> there, I, there I just screech, you sick! You sick! <laughs> uh, we, need to st- we need to slow that one for a bit because you're getting used to it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm becoming numb. <laughs> so, anywho. Um, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am the the slightly indoctrinated Silver Quill. <laughs> and we'll guys catch you next week with another with another fantasy show. Yes, show. See ya. Yes, yes, adios. So, with the legends of magic are real, what does that mean for the future? It means that all legends in Equestria are real. Even the weird ones. Oh no, not that one. Not that creepy one. You know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> that means the one that means the wicked old lady looking for her rusty horseshoe is out there somewhere. Oh well that is, is true. <laughs>